Didn't see you there. <laughs> Let's think about how we experience the world. Humans are very visual creatures. We're often looking at things with our eyes. It's a very common mode we have for experiencing things in the outside world. So how does that work? Well, light bounces off an object. And that light ricochets and enters your eyes, goes and through some pathways into your brain where it's converted into some kind of format that your brain can recognize. It's turned into a mental representation. So you've taken something from the outside world and you've converted it into a form that can exist in your mind. That's cool. But how does that actually result in experience? How does that result in me having an internal experience of the outside world? You've managed to create a mind internal representation of the outside world. You've got an image inside your mind instead of outside of it. But there's a problem. How do you experience the image? Usually we think of images as something you have to see with your eyes. If you see something in the world, take that information and you turn it into a mental representation and the form that mental representation takes is a mental image. Well, it kind of seems like something inside your mind still has to view it. So, how does this work? Enter the Cartesian theater. We might refer to this as the mind's eye, and we might think of it as the center of consciousness. This is the place inside our minds where we experience the world. Remember that we are sort of trapped inside our bodies. We don't have direct access to the outside world except through these narrow channels through our sensory experience. Sensory information comes in through our sense organs and then it filters into this interior part of ourselves, into the center of consciousness, into our mind's eye, our Cartesian theater. And that's where we see and sense things from the outside world. It seems like a plausible story. Information comes in from the outside, and once it's inside, then you can experience it. But there may be a problem with this. We've introduced another layer that still requires an experiencer. So what is it that's inside you that's going to view those images once they come from the outside world inside your mind? It seems we have to introduce another agent, another experiencer, some kind of homunculus that can view the mental images now that they're inside your mind. Okay, maybe that can work. Maybe we do have like a little version of ourselves inside our minds that can experience things once they go into the mind. But of course, there's still a problem. How does the homunculus experience the images? If you converted images into mental representations and then still required another viewer to actually view them, the homunculus is going to have the same problem that you did. Now the mental images are going to go into the homunculus's eyes and he will convert it into a form he can understand, but he won't be able to view it. He'll need another homunculus inside his mind to convert it and to view it. And that introduces an infinite regress. Each homunculus needs its own homunculus and each of the next homunculus will need its own homunculus, etc., etc., to eternity. This infinite regress is also sometimes called a grounding problem. The infinite regress means there's no ground for the process. The process just keeps receding further and further to infinity. What will view the mental images? Well, there's another experiencer inside you that will view them. Well, what's inside that experiencer? Well, there's another experiencer inside that experiencer. It's homunculi all the way down. So how can a mind experience the world if every mind requires another embedded mind to view and interpret the representations? This is actually a huge problem. How can we resolve this? How can we make sense of how we make sense of the outside world from an internal perspective? How can we take things from the outside world and experience them inside our minds without requiring another embedded mind to experience our own mental representations? and another embedded mind to experience the representations of that embedded mind, and so on and so on and so on. How can we stop the regress? How can we introduce a ground into this grounding problem? Cognitive science is full of huge questions, like how do we define the mind? How do we define experience? How do we define the self in relation to minds? Like when I say I experienced something, what does the I refer to? 
What actually did the experiencing? Was it my brain? Was it some sub part of my brain? Maybe only a small piece of my brain is actually actively experiencing things. Or is it the sum total of me? Does it require all of my parts acting together? What if I lose some of my parts? Am I still me? Can I still experience everything? And then how does this apply to computers and AI? Do computers have minds? Do they experience the world in any way that we would recognize? These are big, important questions. And these are the kinds of questions that I want us to think about and grapple with. And there are no easy answers here. This all relates to an ancient puzzle called the mind-body problem. Are mental states separable from physical states? Is there a way to resolve the problem of experience while respecting causality? The mind-body problem is the intersection of two realms, the physical and the mental. What's the relationship between the physical realm and the mental realm? Is the mental realm entirely non-physical? Is the mental realm in some way grounded in the physical realm? The mind and body kind of seem like different things, right? The body is matter, it's biology, it's physical, it's measurable, it's directly observable. It obeys clear cause and effect and physical laws. The mind is a totally different animal. It consists of thoughts and beliefs and emotions. They're not material or biological. They don't seem to be physical. Are they measurable? It's not clear whether we can measure these things in a direct way. Can they even be directly observed? Do they obey physical laws? It's hard to say. These feel like very different kinds of things. Yet there must be some kind of causal relationship between the mind and the body. We know that we are made of matter and we are subject to physical laws, and we know that we are also capable of thoughts and beliefs and desires and emotions. Unless we are willing to violate causality, there must be some kind of causal link between these two realms. So what is the nature of that causal relationship between mind and body? There are many, many proposed answers to this question. And we'll talk about several of these. In the next lecture, we'll talk about them in more detail. One proposal is dualism. Maybe the material brain is too different from immaterial conscious experience for them to be the same kind of thing. Maybe conscious experience and thoughts are completely non-physical, and maybe they take the form of some kind of non-physical substance. Maybe matter and mind are two entirely different kinds of things. Maybe they are composed of entirely different kinds of substances. Maybe there is a hard line separating the two, a duality between mind and body. By contrast, monism says, no, there's only one substance. The mind, conscious experience, physical reality, they're all in the same domain. They're all made of the same kind of stuff. Of course, there are a few different flavors of monism. You might say that everything is physical. Maybe the mind and the body are the same in the sense that everything ultimately has a material physical cause. But you could also take another approach and say, well, maybe everything is mental. If there are two apparent kinds of things, mental stuff and physical stuff, that we think ultimately coalesces into a single kind of thing, sure, it could all be physical, but could it also all be mental? And there are a lot of traditions that treat the entire universe in this way, that maybe the entire universe is all just mental stuff in one form or another. But if we think that mind and body at some level are fundamentally the same thing because everything ultimately has to be physical, which I think is a rational thing to think and seems to be what most people believe, that the universe that we live in is full of physical matter, so everything that we see and interact with in the physical universe must ultimately be explained in terms of physical matter. The question is, can we describe mental states in terms of physical states? Like, what is pain? Why does pain feel bad? And could we say that pain is some particular firing of neurons in humans if each of us has a slightly different brain and a slightly different pattern of neurons and a slightly different pattern of neural firing in response to pain? What is it that unifies our experiences together in the physical sense? So the mind-body problem is all about the direction of influence between the body and mind. It's about that causal link. Does the mind control the body? Does the body control the mind? 
Does it work both ways? Is there a meaningful difference between body and mind? And I think intuitively the mind seems to control the body. I think that's how we sort of intuitively think about ourselves, right? Think, oh, I was hungry, so I got up and I got something to eat. That's my mind telling me what to do. And it sort of relates to the concept of free will, which incidentally is a huge can of worms that I don't think we should get too far into. But say we assume we have free will and we direct our own actions. Well, what does that really mean? When you make a decision, what exactly is it that's making the decision? Where do our thoughts come from? We could assume that there's something inside us that directs our thoughts, but what directs the thoughts of that thing? It's the homunculus problem all over again. We get another infinite regress. So how can we solve this? How can we solve the problem of action, the problem of mind interacting with matter? I want to make a distinction between what the mind does and how it feels to do those things. The problem is experience feels really subjective. And that subjective feeling is called qualia. Dan Dennett says qualia is an unfamiliar term for something that could not be more familiar to each of us, the ways things seem to us. So qualia is just another word for that subjective experience we have of the world. Each of us has some kind of subjective experience, the way the world seems to us. And we don't have access to each other's subjective experience. I don't know if yours is the same as mine, and I can't know. And there are a lot of interesting questions we could ask about this, like would a mind instantiated in something other than a brain have a similar kind of subjective experience? This is an extremely important question now that we are getting further and further towards general artificial intelligence. Are artificial intelligences having a subjective experience? Maybe not now, but will they someday? Is that even possible? Is it conceivable? Would an intelligent computer, a truly intelligent computer, experience the world the same way as a human? Why? Why not? Right now we don't know, and it's not clear if we can ever know. But if not, if you think the answer to this is definitely no, my question to you would be, what is it that precludes it from consideration as a mind? What do you think about a computer? Rules it out from having qualia. Is there anything special about human minds or human brains that enables us to have subjective experiences? Or is this something that we could, in principle, replicate? Let me put it this way, Mr. Amer. The 9000 series is the most reliable computer ever made. No 9,000 computer has ever made a mistake or distorted information. Do you believe that Hal has genuine emotions? Well, he acts like he has genuine emotions. Um, of course, he's programmed that way to make it easier for us to talk to him. But as to whether or not he has real feelings is something I don't think anyone can truthfully answer. The philosopher Thomas Nagel wrote a really influential paper called What is it like to be a bat? It's a pretty provocative title. Thomas Nagel says there's something that it is like to have a conscious mental state. And he uses the example of a bat. Say, imagine that you're a bat. Well, really, you can't imagine what it's like to be a bat. You have no idea. We have no idea what their experience of the world is like. And they don't know what ours is like. I don't know what yours is like. It's totally inaccessible. This kind of an anti-reductionist account. There is some kind of subjective experience that can't be explained by physical processes. We can't imagine what it's like to be a bat because conscious experience itself is totally subjective. Even if we could fully explain what a bat is doing, we can fully explain bat physiology, what kinds of computations the bat brain is performing. We can describe bat echolocation using those three levels of analysis. But just because we can describe and understand echolocation, does that mean that we know what it's like to be a bat? Thomas Nagel would say, no, of course not. You have no idea. There's something missing here. You haven't actually been a bat. You cannot know what the subjective experience of being a bat is like unless you have been a bat and have experienced the world as a bat. 
So what is it like to be you? Can it be described? Could you describe to another person what it's like to be you, what your subjective experience of the world is like? The problem is we can only describe what, for example, what bats are doing in objective scientific terms. We can talk about sound waves and we can talk about the brain and we can say, oh, we can actually replicate this process using computers and sonar. But those terms, those objective scientific terms, just don't seem to be sufficient to describe our internal subjective experience. Maybe we have a better idea of what it's like to be other people. Maybe you can imagine what it's like to be me and I can imagine what it's like to be you. And I might have a better understanding of that than what it would be like to be a bat. But I still can't be sure. Every time someone tells you what they're thinking or feeling, if they tell you what their subjective experience of the world is, it's mediated by language. We can only express it to another person through language. Or maybe dance, or maybe art, or maybe music. But it's always going to be filtered through some kind of lens. And that means that we'll never really be sure because we don't have direct access to anyone else's subjective internal experience. I can't ever be sure if mine is really like yours. Science gives objective accounts of phenomena using the scientific method. We define terms. We test hypotheses. Hypotheses have to be falsifiable. We can describe things at different levels of analysis. But experience is subjective. And if consciousness is subjective, can cognitive science explain it? This is a big question for us. Cognitive science takes a very firm stance. We have a very solid framework for viewing the mind as an information processor, viewing the mind in terms of computation, representation, the flow of information, inputs and outputs. Is there a way that we can ever reach a description of conscious experience, a description of qualia, using those terms, using those descriptive tools? It's not exactly clear. Okay, so what does all this have to do with functionalism? Remember that functionalism is our foundational framework for cognitive science. Cognitive scientists are going to view the mind in functional terms. So if minds can be instantiated in radically different physical systems, which we believe if we're functionalists, remember that's multiple realizability, that multiple different physical systems can realize the same kinds of mental states. So if that's true, if different minds can be instantiated in radically different physical systems, does that mean that they can have similar subjective experience? Can consciousness exist in other systems? This is all really about the perceived difference between human minds and computers. And this is something I feel really strongly about, so I bring it up a lot, and I talk about it a lot. And you might get sick of it. And you probably have your own really strong opinions about this. How different are human minds and computers? Do computers have minds? Well, functionalism claims that anything that shares the functionality of a mind is a mind. So the question then is, do computers fit this definition? Currently, maybe they don't. Could they? Is it at least in principle possible for computers to meet this definition? Maybe. But maybe there is an insurmountable qualitative divide between brains and computers. Can a computer experience qualia? Would a computer have to experience qualia in order to qualify as having a mind? Could we conceive of minds that don't have subjective internal experience? And why should we doubt that a computer could have consciousness or qualia? I think the usual answer to this is that computers can't think or feel anything subjectively because they have to be told what to think or feel, which wouldn't be qualitative, right? Because it's programmed by someone who knows how to describe it. Computers don't seem to do anything on their own. They have to be told or programmed. And quality is supposed to be self-generated. Is that enough to say that computers don't have qualia? I think that that would mean that it would be functionally impossible for us to ever instill subjective experience into a machine. Maybe that's true. I think it remains to be seen. But there's a bigger issue here, which is we may never know because it might not be something that we can ever observe. Okay, I want to do a quick thought experiment. This is a thought experiment by the philosopher Frank Jackson. It's called the Mary's Room Experiment. And the scenario goes like this. Mary is a brilliant scientist who is 
for whatever reason, which we won't get into, forced to investigate the world from a black and white room via a black and white television monitor. Maybe a more modern way to imagine the scenario is that Mary is forced to interact only through VR, and the VR is only feeding her images in black and white. So Mary's entire experience of the world is totally devoid of color. She specializes in the neurophysiology of vision and acquires all the physical information there is to obtain about what goes on when we see ripe tomatoes or the sky and use terms like red or blue and so on. She discovers, for example, just exactly which wavelength combinations from the sky stimulate the retina and exactly how this produces via the central nervous system the contraction of the vocal cords and expulsion of air from the lungs that result in the uttering of the sentence, the sky is blue. So what will happen when Mary is released from her black and white room or is given a color television monitor? Will she learn something? That's the question. Mary knows everything there is to know about the color blue, the color red, about the physiology of how those colors are observed and perceived, about how we utter sentences in response to having seen them. She knows everything there is to know about the physical systems. But she has never personally experienced it. She's never seen the color blue or the color red. So if she walks out of that room for the first time and sees the sky, will she learn something? This is fundamentally getting to the core issue of whether you believe in qualia, whether you believe there is something to human cognition that cannot be explained by just reference to the physical. If Mary leaves the room, sees the sky for the first time, and gains some new knowledge when she sees that color blue, then you have to admit that qualia exists. If you think Mary has learned something by that experience, then you believe in qualia. Because what has she gained when she leaves the room? She gains the knowledge of the qualia by experiencing it. And if you accept that, then you have to accept that there's more to know about sensation than the physical properties and those three levels of description. Mary may be able to learn something about what blue feels like to her her subjective experience of blue. And that's completely separate from the objective scientific descriptions, which can be shared by other people. So Jackson uses this argument to argue against physicalism. Everything can't just all be physical stuff. There's got to be something else. Qualia are real and qualia are not physical. Okay, so how does all of this fit together? Well, I compare brains to computers a lot. You're going to hear me do this a lot. I'm going to keep doing it. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop comparing brains to computers. <laughs> I'm in too deep. <laughs> and it's a really useful metaphor in cognitive science. But of course, there are persistent problems with this. And one problem for functionalism is that a machine could be programmed to see the color red. It could even mimic the same human functional process. But that machine maybe wouldn't have the same experience of what it's like to see red that a person would have. So what we could program a computer to know would be similar to what Mary knows before she first experiences blue for herself. If you program a computer to know what blue is, it knows all of the facts about blue, but it hasn't experienced it in the way that we experience it. And that's exactly like Mary in the room. She knows everything there is to know about it, but she hasn't experienced it personally. Okay, what about computers that have visual sensory transducers? Um, you attach a camera to a computer and it can see. It can gather visual information. But what is it actually representing? It has to be some kind of coding of the visual information that's pre-programmed, right? It has to convert that visual information into a format that it can experience. Is that really an experience the way that we think we have experiences? I think a functionalist might argue that these are not actually very different. When a human being sees something in the outside world, we translate that into information that can be represented mentally. And if you hook up camera up to a computer, it's converting information from the outside world into a format that it can represent internally. 
it's not clear what's missing when we translate from computers to human beings. That missing piece, qualia, it's a persistent mystery. So it's not clear to me whether there is a significant qualitative difference between humans and computers. For all I know, my computer is having qualia. It is having a subjective internal experience. It just can't express that to me. I don't have access to it. Maybe not. Maybe it's not having any internal experience. But we can't know because we don't have direct access to it. Okay, so just to review some of the key concepts we talked about today, we talked about the Cartesian theater, the idea that maybe we have some kind of internal mind's eye where we can view mental images. Of course, that introduces a problem in the form of the infinite regress, the grounding problem. If you need to have an experiencer inside your mind in order to experience things in the Cartesian theater, then that experiencer must also have a mind which will also require another internal experiencer and so on and so on and so on. We talked about the mind-body problem. What's the relationship between the mind and the body? There must be some kind of causal link, some kind of causal relationship between mind and body. What direction does it go? How does it work? How do we link these two things which seem very different? And we talked about qualia, that sort of missing piece that can't be explained by physicalism, can't be explained in terms of physical matter the subjective experience that we all have, but that we can't share with each other. And we're not sure whether we share with other organisms or with machines. So these are big questions. How does all of this fit together? In the next lecture, we're gonna talk more about the mind-body problem. We're gonna talk more about some of the proposed solutions to the mind-body problem and that causal relationship.